All right, so in the last video, we saw that we can use the squeeze theorem and a little bit of geometry to establish the fact that the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x is 0. Okay? Um, and we might note that 0 is also sine of 0. Right? Sine of 0 is equal to 0. Um, so basically the argument is that, well, sine x is, is always less than x. If you, want, you know, if you want to dispense with absolute values, we could, always, we could always put it this way, right? Minus, so sine x will always be between minus x and x um, for x in the, uh, either the first or the fourth quadrants, right? For x between, let's say, minus 1 and 1, this will hold. x and minus x, they're both going to 0 as x goes to 0. Sine x then must also be going to 0 according to the squeeze theorem. All right, how do we use that to get the value of, of the limit for, for sine at any other point? Well, we can do a little bit of a trick. What we can do is the following. So we can say that x is the same thing as sine of x minus c plus c. Okay? Uh, now remember that there is an angle addition formula for sine. And we can write this as sine of x minus c times cosine of c. Okay? plus um, sine of c times cosine of x minus c. Okay? Now, there's a, there's a couple of observations that we have to make. Okay? So we can make these kind of notes on the side. One is that we know cos x, right? Well, we know that cos x can be written as, well, depending on which quadrant you're in, it's going to be either plus or minus 1 minus sine x squared under the square root, right? And so in particular, we know that if we're close to 0, if we're close to 0, we know that Cosine is positive. Cosine is positive in these two quadrants, right? So we're close to 0. So if, if x is close to 0, we know that sine x close to 0. We know there's a, a rule for square roots. There's a limit rule for square roots. Um, and so we can use this to get that the limit as x goes to 0 of cos x, well, this is going to go to zero, and we choose the positive root if we're in the either, you know if we're in the first or the fourth quadrants, and so we can find that that limit is one, which happens to be cos of zero again, right? Um, the other thing to notice is that so that's the first point. The second point is that if x is approaching c, x minus c is approaching 0. Okay? And and so what you can conclude from this is that the limit as x approaches c of sine of x minus c, right, is the same thing as the limit maybe we do some substitution say u is x minus c, the limit as u goes to 0 sine of u. Maybe you call it theta if you like. And we've just established that that limit is 0. Okay? So using the limit laws, right, this is a constant, right? We can use the sum rule. We can use the product rule. And, and so we break things down. We say, so this limit is 0. So 0 times cos c. Sine of c times 
Well, the limit is x goes to c of cosine of x minus c. And same reasoning that we just applied here for sine also works for cosine, right? So that's going to be the same thing as taking the limit of cos as x goes to 0. We've established that that's 1. So this is sine of c times 1. And that gives you sine of c. OK. So that takes care of this, this limit, right? So, so this says that limits for sine can be done by direct substitution. By playing around with this relationship between sine and cosine, we can make the same case for cos. Or we could do sort of this angle addition kind of game if you want as well, using the fact that the limit of, of cos is 1. Um, so sine and cosine can both, you know, those limits can be done by direct substitution, right? Uh, and, and once you know that, well, we know that tan is sine over cos, so limits involving tan can be done by direct substitution, as long as the denominator is not 0, right? Same idea with secant, cosecant, right? So in fact, for all the trig functions, you can do limits by direct substitution as long as you're within the domain of those functions.